Okay, I'm going to share my screen to for the lecture. Just give me a second. <clears throat> the right side, okay. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to uh, starting um, the first part of the lecture today is actually introduce about this this class. Let's see what I have. Okay, so here is my information. Um, you probably already got some of that uh, via uh, Canvas or Facebook, and please join the the Facebook group. Uh, that's my office, and I realized that when I this quarter, I mean, there, there was some issue with the pandemic, uh, like this week, we are still doing online and hopefully starting from next week, we can go back to the campus. If we can do in-person office hour, then I will use a larger room, which I will announce. It's also in academic search which we can actually host about 10, 15 students uh, together uh, at a time. And the reason uh, for me to have that kind of setting is I, I realize a lot of collaboration, a lot of programming, a lot of project idea development in this quarter, in this course, we actually uh, will benefit to having more people uh, discuss together. That's why, um, uh, we will be using a, a different room for, it's not too far away from my office, which means that if you have anything you need to discuss with me very privately, we go to my office. But other than that, when we actually talk about uh, the, the concept or preparation for the midterm exam or the final project, we'll probably use the bigger room for us to work on that. Okay. And Currently, I set up my office hour to be uh, 4 to 5.30 Monday and Thursday. But uh, typically, as we close the deadline about uh, various events, like a programming assignment or midterm or the final project, uh, I will have a lot more uh, office hour uh, available in the same place. Okay, just very quickly let you know. Uh, okay, so just give you some content about what uh, I will be focusing this quarter. Um, so uh, there is a lot of topic we can cover in operating system model. In fact, what's the definition of operating system, which is going to be the first question I'm going to ask you in a moment. And just give you a glimpse about the topics that I will cover for this quarter. Um, I will cover uh, file system. That's that's the beginning of this this quarter. We probably will do this for about uh, I would say a quarter of the time we'll be spending on, on this. This actually include a a single processor operating system file system all the way to uh, distribute the file system like a GFS Google file system Hadoop or MapReduce or any kind of um, um, distribute a file system or content distribution is also a file system and it will involve in any kind of data center type of situation. So you can see that it, it's actually very applicable and it has a lot of impact in today's uh, um, application environment. So that's why I would like to spend uh, one quarter of the, sorry, one third of the time to actually focus on the file system from the smallest one to the biggest one. And just let you know, at the end of the class, uh, at the end of this particular section of the class, there will be a first midterm. So in this course, we'll have two midterm. The first midterm will be after we finish all the file system uh, introduction. And, and the second midterm will be after the, the second part of the topic, which is the real-time uh, scheduling, real-time kernel, those kind of subjects. 
uh, which which there will be a second midterm, and and we don't have a final uh, final exam, but we have a final project, which is the third part. So that's this schedule kind of show you what what um, our plan is this quarter, and and also for the um, the first part, which is the file information system, that we're going to have three programming assignment, uh, which I will talk in depth uh, later in this lecture. Uh, They're all related to file system. I'm not going to give you any programming assignment for uh, real-time scheduling. Um, it's, it's, it's really nice for you to, for example, implement a priority ceiling protocol in the kernel of a Linux operating system or doing lottery scheduling. It's, it's really fun to do that, but it will require uh, a lot of uh, kernel level programming, which I might not have time to be able to cover within the course. I would like to more focus on how do you implement, for example, one of the programming assignment, you actually implement a very simplified version of say Google file system or Hadoop uh, file system. And that's actually, you don't need to touch the kernel. Uh, so it's actually, you can use variety of language to accomplish that. So that's just to let you know, the programming assignment will only be uh, the, belong to the, um, the first topic, which is the file information system. And, and the thing is that for the programming assignment also, you can see that I actually put it here, it's called remote procedure call and uh, uh, JSON, which is Java object, JavaScript object notation. Um, for this part, um, I want you to learn is that this is a, like a very nice toolkit for you to be able to build a lot of a lot of the application, a lot of distributed system concept uh, in today's world. Uh, it, it's basically the dominating paradigm for a lot of things to happen really quickly. And I'm actually why I'm expecting you to learn. Uh, uh, about how to do that via the homework. So by the way, the first homework assignment is essentially ask you to learn how to do remote procedure call and, and be familiar with how do you handle JSON, which is JavaScript object notation. And I, I do provide a lot of help, uh, online resources, some of my lecture, and hopefully this process with all this, this will be a uh, uh, painless process for you to uh, be able to accomplish that. Um, the other thing I do want to mention is that in my lecture, I try to balance between the regular lecture, which is more on the concept. And then for each of the lecture, I will reserve at least five minutes to actually uh, talk about programming issue, to show you some demo and show you what's the pieces, and then you can actually ask me question either in the lecture or after that. So we kind of have a balance between understanding operating system as a purely theoretical conceptual concept versus something which you get your hand dirty and then really realize some of the concept you really need to learn. So uh, so that that's, that's how I plan to, to balance this such that uh, you will have learning for both ends of the spectrum. Okay, the, in the second part of the courses will be on real-time operating system. Uh, this, I will revisit some of the uh, kernel services such as the scheduling, memory management, and the device, and, and all this interrupt handling. And this is the core around issue like, well, how do you actually handle uh, different kind of scheduling policy to be able to be more responsive to the application that's that's required. And uh, for example, I will actually talk about a topic called priority inversion and priority inheritance, which some of you might already learn the concept in the undergraduate courses. Most of the undergraduate courses usually don't have time uh, to cover priority inheritance and priority inversion. Uh, but this is actually a very fundamental for you to be able to design the system right when you deal with a, a real-time constraint with some kind of uh, concurrency control issue you need to handle at the same time. 
Okay, so I'm going to, that's going to be the second part. I will say, I will cover uh, the real-time operating system part in about at most two weeks, maybe one and a half week. So the second topic, real-time operating system will be significantly shorter than the, the, uh, the, the first part, the, the file information system. And, and after that, you're going to have the second midterm, which is basically make sure you understand the concept. So this part, you don't need to worry about programming, but you just need to worry about some of the basic principle. Okay, so that goes to the third part, which is I really uh, like to focus on this part is, is actually fundamentally what is operating system. And based on what is operating system, we actually see that how operating system is play a significant role in the way of connecting variety of uh, application behavior and different kind of computing and the human and the social network together. And as you can see that more and more that this become a core issue in the modern society when we try to connect computer with human together. And in this part that we really provide you some more advanced concept about operating system. So your, our view about operating system is no longer what Microsoft or Linux define, is no longer what Facebook and Google define. In fact, I feel, uh, personally, I feel what Facebook, Google, Amazon, those company, when they provide all this cloud, uh, uh, cloud or edge computing and uh, with the AI support, those kind of thing has become commodity. And, and yet we need to looking forward to some topic the operating system can play that's actually helping for the future need of our society. So, so this part is for a future futurist view about operating system topic. And over here, of course, the, the ultimate goal from this part is actually, I want you to be part of that to actually be able to have a final project, which I will talk about what that is, which is you are the one who is actually going to think about the future based on your understanding about the its current operating system, current distributed operating system, also the current application and what's missing and in the future that you need to look at. Okay, so that's that's kind of the plan, what the curriculum, uh, what I'm going to do uh, this quarter. So I'm going to pause for just uh, um, briefly. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so um, there is no textbook in this class. And so what I um, will be doing is assigning you reading assignment. And these are the, the papers, which is some of them are really classical paper, like those five paper I assigned to you today. Some of you already probably uh, start look at those paper via Canvas. Um, um, those are basically for each of the topic I'm going to talk about. If there is appropriate um, um, publication, I will actually give you, I will select, I have been very selective. Uh, by the way, for example, the first part of the topic, I can actually give you a huge number of paper which waste your time. You should only look at the best paper, which is for understanding. Okay, so just to let you know that this is a, uh, uh, um, a, a, a course without textbook, but you will be uh, assigned paper to read, okay? And, and just, just mention that um, uh, we will not, this is not a, a undergraduate course, which we typically go through uh, every single detail about every single part of the operating system kernel and try to understand that. This is not. Um, we will only, for example, in file system, we actually look at, some part of the code in the typical FreeBSD or Linux kernel, just try to understand a little bit how things got implemented, but we won't be able to touch um, a greater detail. For example, in the real-time operating system kernel, I probably cannot tell you how 
uh, every perspective of how the scheduler in the kernel, how they can be, uh, say, modify or can be changed and uh, how do they work, those kind of things. So just let you know. But if you're interested in those topic, um, um, you should uh, try to find a, a uh, undergraduate version of this course, such as ECS 150, be able to catch those topics. Okay, this is just prerequisite. Uh, so we assume that you know uh, programming language C. Now I actually see that uh, in this class, probably knowing C or assembly language is not so important because uh, I, I just, I probably should update this slides a long time ago because you're not going to do any kind of like a kernel hacking. in in. In the programming assignment, I actually want you to do something more high level, which is what we're doing today using uh, distributed systems such as GFS or, or Hadoop type of system. Over there, we're, we're using things like JSON. So essentially, if you have, you know, a programming language that handles JSON, you probably will do really well. No problem. But the, the recommended programming language that uh, you can use for this class is a C++ because we already have a lot of resources related to C++ uh, to handle the programming assignment, which there is a version about the code, which is using Python, but the Python version is not as mature as C++, just let you know, okay? So just talk to me if you have any concern about um, any of the prerequisites, especially if you never take an undergraduate operating system, you might want to talk to me because uh, I, I might talk about some concept too fast, assuming you already know some of the concept uh, for the whatever the undergraduate operating system uh, you learn um, before you walk into this classroom, okay. Okay, so here is a, a course requirement about how I'm going to grade uh, um, at the end. So 30% is midterm exam. So the first midterm and the second midterm. So the first midterm is going to be 20%. Just, I forgot to put it here. The first midterm because the, the file system proportional is bigger and that will count 20%. Then the second midterm on real-time operating system is 10%. So 30% is two midterm, 20 and 10. And there are three programming assignments. Uh, there will be totally is 20%. The first programming assignment is a 5%. The second one is 5%. The third one is 10%. So it's 20% for the programming assignment, which I, I will hopefully by the end of the class, I can spend five minutes to talk about the first programming assignment, which uh, just released today. Okay. And then those 50%, those you're going to work by yourself. And the TA uh, is going to uh, um, uh, help me to, to grade your uh, exam and, uh, and, and the programs. And, and the next 50% is really on the final project. Okay, so this is, the, uh, remember I say it's, it's an advanced project. So, so the thing is that uh, it's a little bit vague, but on the other hand, it, it it has some specific criteria I'm actually looking for uh, in order for you to, um, to deliver something really nicely. So this is a team project, two to four students. So you should actually start to already uh, connecting each other, try to find the teammate, okay? And, and the second thing is that um, the topic of this, this research project must be related to operating system for the disconnected internet working environment. So, so I assume none of you actually heard about this term called disconnected internet working environment, which I will actually explain what is, uh, what is the concept of disconnected internet working environment, which is itself is a newer environment for us to uh, operate that's actually include a distributed system. So I will actually be able to uh, talk about that in depth, but not at this moment. And the thing is that you're going to do work on a, you're, you're going to have a proposal. So, which means that your team is going to meet with me, which for me to actually be able to uh, evaluate 
and preview about what you like to do. And the thing is that if I feel that this is a acceptable idea, so I, I usually challenge students for two things. So number one uh, is that I want to make sure that your topic is really advanced. It's not just something which is, uh, say, uh, let me give you an example. If you actually develop something which Google, or Facebook, and Amazon are already doing, you're already using, that's obviously uh, not something that you should be wasting your time because industry already doing that. So we need to look at topic, which is actually more advanced than that. So that actually require a lot of creative thinking. Uh, your team need to come up with. And, and the thing is that in the process, what I can challenge you because I have a little bit more experience than, uh, than you are. So therefore I'm actually going to challenge you most of the cases. Well, what's the difference between what you would like to do with company XYZ are doing? So this is something which is in that process is actually push you try to move beyond what's actually what industry or, or whatever uh, the, the, the well-known uh, system is already being built and such that you can actually have a vision that's actually um, very, very interesting and innovative. And, and the second thing, the second role I'm actually trying to uh, uh, help you is try to determine Whatever you're doing, whether it's too big for you to actually try to accomplish in three weeks. So essentially what we like to do is that we want to have a vision that's actually really big, but in terms of the prototype implementation, that's why I focus a lot on implementation. You need to actually have a running system. So the, the concept is very advanced, but when you want to demonstrate the concept, the the, the implementation or the prototype could be actually much more simplified. As long as you can demonstrate the concept that's advanced, that's good enough. So, so I'm going to help you work with you, try to cut down the scope in such that the first prototype implementation that you're going to run in the demo at the end of the um, quarter is actually indeed something that's very much doable. Okay, so in fact, I actually cherish the concept much more than the lines of code that you you uh, develop. In fact, sometimes I said, if if this is the idea, you can demonstrate with one thousand lines of code, and then you write one million lines of code to demonstrate that that's a big failure. Okay, so that's that's the how much I want to emphasize about how you actually doing the implementation. Okay. Okay, um, I want to pause just for a moment. Any question at this moment? Let me actually check. I saw some chat message. I, um, yes, I will talk about some of the research project. I will make some suggestion to you, uh, Fu Ming. Um, okay. You, you can, um, uh, Josh, uh, to find the, the, the Ting Mei, yes. Um, I think it's important for, uh, for us to be able to use uh, Facebook or using uh, your social network or, or using Canvas to contact each other, try to do that. But uh, by no means, if you actually have uh, any kind of, uh, um, uh, you need some help for me to find the team member, uh, just let me know, okay? Uh, uh, for Rohan, no, the, the, the number of students uh, in the, in the in a team is at most four. In fact, I actually prefer you only have three. The, the reason I say two to four is I feel two is, is probably you cannot do too much, uh, a lot of interesting stuff. Four is probably okay. Five, I'm guarantee you, you have a one or maybe two member is kind of idle in the process. Okay, so three to me is the best for, 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 for a project like this. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, so that's my introduction. Now I'm actually starting uh, doing the real lecture on the technical subject. Um, so we're going to talk about operating system. Okay, so what I like to do, I'm going to
get rid of my slide. How do I get rid of my slide? Yeah, I'm going to turn off my stop sharing for a while. Okay, so now at least I see, wow, we have 85 students here. Okay, I'm actually going to spend um, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put you in different breakout room for about two minutes. I'm going to split you and I want you to discuss with each other. Uh, I'm going to use the random assignment for you to different room, but I want you to discuss is your group will come out, each of the breakout room will come out with a definition about what is operating system. What's your definition of operating system? You can actually look for Google uh, to find out what's the Wikipedia definition for operating system, or based on your experience, what is operating system? I mean, there, there is actually no, in my opinion, there is a no definite answer for this question, but it's, it's, it's a very healthy for us to think about uh, what, is our perception about the operating system and how can that perception be shrink or grow based on the application we're seeing, okay? So I'm going to assign everybody into a breakout room. Let me see how many I should assign with 80 students. I'm going to assign 16 breakout room. Assign automatically. So each room will have maybe five or six students. So please join the, the your breakout room. So that's what I think. So, yeah. Yeah, don't, don't let me interrupt you. I'm just uh, go around round robin to every uh, single classroom a little bit and happy new year to all of you. Happy new year. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I, was, I was saying that um, the operating system is like, uh, so it lays in a layer between hardware and software. So it's more act, as, uh, act like a uh, resource management so it kind of uh, manages the resources of the hardware and provides support for the hard, uh, the software running on. I mean, there are not much things, right? Yeah. Hello, hello, Professor. Hi, just wanted here to say hello. I'm Ron Robin everywhere. So <laughs> okay. uh, um, um, yeah, go ahead. Don't let me just pretend I'm totally transparent. All right. <laughs> and, um, and happy new year to all of you. Oh, same Josh, to you. Maybe this is opportunity you can find your teammates. Yes, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> Someone here. Yeah, right, yeah. right, right, right. Okay. There's a, another uh, Malik is an aerospace uh, engineering undergrad, or he was an uh, aerospace engineering major like I was. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so uh, so neither of you are uh, computer science graduate. You're, no. you're. Yeah. Oh, that's I, great. You're, I got a minor, but not not a. 
No, so. that's great. That's great. I I'm I'm so glad that we have a student from a different perspective. Um, I I always think. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, if if uh, Vishnu and uh, Charlie. You're you're actually from uh, computer science. In my opinion, computer science is really a boring major. <laughs> <laughs> Mechanical engineering, MAE is a lot more interesting. You build real thing. Okay. By the way, <laughs> that's how how I try to transform computer science uh, program to actually to make it more um, um, interesting. Yeah, yeah. You do you know. Yeah, Sorry, I have this, a this, this, from computer science. Yeah. This new, are you a computer science major? Yeah. Okay. And Charlie Ann, are you a computer science major? I was computer science and Japanese language and culture, but I haven't taken operating systems before. So okay. So you you have a Japanese culture? Yes. Japanese. Okay. So my collaborator on the ethic operating system, which I will talk, is collaborate with Fujisu. And they're actually going to send someone to UC Davis in uh, in March, which which I have a very close relationship with Fuji. So maybe you can help me with Japanese translation. Okay, yeah. So so um, this is just I always kind of joke about this is that I, I feel computer science uh, curriculum is training the student try to write the program without any syntax error the first time. So if you make any mistake when you write the program, the compiler didn't like it, you're bad, okay? So that, that's something which I hate, right? We would like to build things I broke and if you give me tons of error message, I don't care as long as I can make it. Okay, so I, I will not disturb you. I need to go to the other uh, breakout room, okay? Nice to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Everything okay here? I'm just yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. good. I, I'm just wrong, Robin. The the <laughs> room from room and to see what's going on. Okay, just to let you know in about thirty seconds, I'm going to bring everybody back. Okay. Okay. Sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm. I, I was saying that. Do we have uh, everybody back from the breakout room? Or we still have people there. Okay, so thank you very much. I only had time to visit like a three breakout room before I have to uh, come back. Um, I don't want you to spend too much time there. All right. So, um, any anybody from. Uh, from any of the group would like to share. Uh, I, I want to look for three volunteer to talk about your view about what is operating system. Any, any three of you, please. Uh... Any volunteer? Yeah, I can go. If ah, guys... Go ahead, go ahead. Awesome. So we kind of started out with like a very, very rudimentary perspective, which is like programs managing and securing other program. But quickly kind of like floor out of that and we realize that um, operating systems as a concept is becoming more and more elusive. Because you think of like the cloud as a whole system, 
that in itself is kind of like an operating system itself. So you can kind of think of something like Kubernetes, right? It's a system that essentially manages other operating systems, but in itself, it's becoming an operating system for the cloud. And then you have components like maybe like S3, right? Which is just purely a storage component. So we have like exposed operating system components that are in isolation, but they all orchestrate to become like one single big operating system. So we thought that was pretty interesting. Great, excellent, excellent observation. Yes. Who else? Yeah, I think I can go. Go ahead, please. So what I think of, of an operating system is, is it's the first level of a software above the hardware and, mm. it, man it, and it manages the hardware. Mm -hmm. So basically it's just the meeting point, just before the meeting point of a software and hardware of a computer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like a point where the software and the hardware meet. It's, it's right. one, le one level before that. Right. That's good. That's a, that's a good definition. And in fact, that is uh, one of the um, uh, fairly popular definition of an operating system. It's a layer of software that's actually bridging the, the hardware resources. Hardware Chen, Chen. Yeah, who else? Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yudkarsh, you want to say something? Sorry. We, do we have another volunteer to share about your view about operating system? Okay, if not, I'm going to share my screen and continue my lecture. <clears throat> So I, I appreciate uh, the both comments. That's actually, uh, they are, they're both correct and they're hinting at different perspective about what is operating system. Um, in some sense, operating system is a piece of software to, um, to bridge the hardware like I show in this slide and, uh, and then to supporting the, the applications that's over there. Um, on the other hand, we see that the, the modern operating system architecture, especially when we have uh, internet, that we're actually connecting all the systems together, we tend to extend that hardware from a, a single processor to a network of resources. And then you have application running on top of that. When I, when, when I think about this, this concept, there is a third layer of the consideration, which is try to generalize uh, the idea of operating system, which is something I want to offer as just as a possibility or as a, as a reference to consider is that the idea of the operating system is really to serve whatever application or whatever the layer of service or whatever program or whatever hardware, maybe even hardware on top of the operating system. So essentially, if this is a single processor operating system, I'm serving your editor, your uh, web browser and those kind of application. But if I'm in a more cloud environment that your application might be more complicated, your application is no longer just running on a single device. Your application, for example, Facebook, you can think about is a huge application that's actually involved so many users. There's 2 billion active user being accessed the system. And how do you actually be able to provide a operating system to actually be able to support this application? So essentially anything that's actually helped applications. And remember when I use applications, I'm using plural, means that the operating system typically is supporting not just a single application, but multiple application at the same time, and sometimes support multiple application be able to working with each other better 
because of the operating system, which we will actually touch when we move to later part of the class. But let's actually start it with the, the, the simple one. I'm going to skip this traditional slide. This, you know that this is the, the new operating system. And then I said, when you have a, uh, um, a more um, internet environment, you can have this kind of operating system. The green is really the operating system. Or uh, some of my subject is that you can actually think about uh, social network, the, the data that uh, Facebook or Twitter are collecting itself as an operating system because some application is utilizing the, the what, what I call the social resources. The resources doesn't have to be hardware. By the way, in the modern society, you can think about that. We actually provide data to Google and Facebook. So essentially Facebook is representing us as a information resources because we provide, we're, at, we're the resources to Facebook and we're the application to Facebook as well. If you think about that, that's, that's actually interesting view. And, and then in that environment, when human become both resources and application, then what's the role of the operating, uh, what is the role of the operating system in, in managing that kind of resources? But this is the topic I will I will actually touch in the third part of the uh, of this course. Okay, so now I'm actually going to starting with the traditional way of looking at operating system, which is the um, the kernel. So this is a picture that hasn't changed much since I would say 1970. So this is essentially some of the earliest version of uh, Unix operating system. This particular diagram, by the way, is from FreeBSD uh, 5.4 kernel. But if you compare FreeBSD 5.4 versus AT&T Unix uh, system five, the kernel structure is essentially the same. The functionality, maybe ter terminology change a little bit, but uh, more or less they're the same. So here, let's actually start looking at this, this kernel. Uh, what is the operating system kernel? You can see that on below is the hardware. The hardware is connecting to all your device, your hard disk, your, um, uh, your, your network device, your any kind of device that you can connect, your, your mouse, your keyboard, whatever is actually under the hardware. And on top of this, is called what we call a system call interface to the kernel. Um, so when, when um, I, I will just go through this very, very quick, but because I, we don't have time to cover this concept. For example, um, when we learned about a operating system kernel architecture like this, we actually want to differentiate what's the difference between library function call and system call. What's the difference? If, if you look at a typical uh, Unix environment, like a Linux, if you actually look at the manual, that's actually section two, that's all system call. If you actually look at the manual of section three, it's all library function call. So essentially what's the difference between section two, which is a system call, versus section three, which is a library call, is that whether that call will trigger a trap to the kernel, a software trap to the kernel, such that kernel will need to serve that application. If a call that's actually going to shift its control to the kernel, such that kernel will serve this application, that's a system call. But if, if it's a shift, it's a call, does not trigger the kernel to be involved in handling that, then that is not a system call. That's called library function call. So just tell you that there's a difference between uh, the, the system call interface and normal function call. And, and the thing is that, uh, let me actually ask you a question since we're here. Uh, anybody can tell me example about what is a system call and what is a uh, library function call. Anybody can give me an example. What's the system call library? I'm actually trying to test how well 
uh, or maybe you've already forgot from your undergraduate operating system level. So anybody want to give me an example about what is a system call in Unix environment? Yes, please go ahead. Um, so an example usually um, relates to like something that involves security. So it could be like opening a TCP connection or reading from a file that would usually involve a kernel. Okay, so uh, when you open the uh, um, a a connection TCP connection, you will use the command like a connect, for example, okay. connect and uh, or or bind or listen, and those kind of call need to basically tell the operating system to listen to something. Okay, great, that's a good example. Thank you, uh, Suhaya. And any any example? Uh, anybody want to offer an example like what is a uh, what is not a system call? Library function call. For example, if you compute a uh, um, uh, let me actually just say compute a cosine function, which is a mathematical function. Those kind of functions is definitely not involved any system kernel service. That's actually what we call the regular library call. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question. Um, what is what about malloc? So I assume you know malloc and free, right? Is malloc a system call? Let me see, anybody provide answer on the chat? Send and receive, yeah, send and receive our system call. How about uh, malloc? So, so you send, you send malloc no, is that no means it's not a system call? Is that right? Uh, right. Yes, you're right, yeah. The, the, the malloc is not a system call. Uh, let's actually take a look at this. You can see my screen, right? If I do man malloc, you see that the malloc is number three. If you do a man on that function, malloc is memory. And the thing is that it's not system call because there is a memory map in the process such that when you allocate the memory, you actually already give the whole virtual memory address to a particular program or to a particular application. And therefore, when you allocate memory, it's actually that particular program is allocating and free memory within that single machine, a single program. So therefore, the kernel doesn't need to worry about that. So malloc is not a system call. For example, if you do man open, I think man open, oh, not open one. I want to do, let me do a, connect. Yeah, you see connect, as I mentioned, connect is a system call is two when you have that. So just to let you know, this is something just refresh your memory about what's going on. Okay, now I'm going back to my PowerPoint slide. Let me get rid of this, move this. Down. I just don't understand why Soon, always want to put the, that particular bar on top to block my screen. Okay, anyway, all right, I'm happy now. So, so now we know this is called system call interface on the top, and this is hardware in the button. So essentially a traditional view, when I emphasize the word traditional view means that I think this view itself need to be extended and people need to think about a more general picture about what's operating system. So this is a traditional view. It essentially describes what are the most basic services a operating system or operating system kernel need to provide it to the application and bridging between the hardware and the system call interface. So let's actually take a look at this very quickly. So essentially on the left side of this picture, 
everything here is about device driver. It's essentially from all kinds of device, including, uh, uh, well, they put actually network device here because the reason they put network device here is because uh, they want to, um, to put network file system, which is between file system and the network protocol together. It's called NFS. Um, in that picture, that's why they put network device here. But the major chunk of the operating system service in the kernel, it's really just handling a uh, different kind of device. And, and on the, the rest of the system, you can see that part of the device is actually hard disk device. And the hard disk device on top of that is actually have FS. You can see now with a lot of FS, which is FFS stands for FAST file system. That was one of the uh, earliest design about uh, Unix. In fact, today we're still using FFS. And on top of that is called UFS, Unix file system. And essentially what is the U difference between UFS and FFS? So the, the, the quick answer to that is that FFS is handling the block of data and its relationship to the hard disk. While the UFS, Unix file system is handling the directory. So if you think about a file system, you have to have a directory and then you have to have a disk block, which is really contain those, those uh, block. So that's why you have a UFS, you have a FFS, for example. And then you have something called NFS, which is a network file system, which is instead of accessing the local hard disk, it's actually accessing the remote hard disk uh, through the network device driver. So that, that's why the whole file system. So essentially what we're saying is that on this side, we have device. On this side, we have file system. And there's a bunch of other services not included. For example, memory management, which is a virtual memory that's actually here. And some kind of uh, one thing they didn't show at all in this uh, picture is the uh, scheduling. How do you actually handle different uh, processes? Let me actually show you this picture. I might have this picture somewhere. Oh, I don't have that. Okay, anyway, don't worry. So. And then in this picture, on top of that, you actually see something called Vino. You actually see something called Vino, which is what we call virtual no or under virtual file system, which is a, a major uh, abstraction development uh, in the 1980s by some microsystem. Now as part of Oracle, uh, they actually developed uh, Vino, which is, turn out to be a advanced, not advanced, a preliminary version about today's virtualization. Um, if you think about earlier, we talk about cloud, we talk about AWS, we talk about all this Google cloud, they're basically some kind of virtualization of resources. And Vino is essentially the first kind of a general distributed virtualization, which is actually going to be the paper number four that uh, we assign. I assign you, by the way, five paper. Uh, the first one paper is actually talk about UFS and FFS. And the two and three is talk about some of the file system, but in a different angle. And number four is about Vino. All right. And so this is basically a, a very quick introduction to just give you a, an idea about the system call and uh, the hardware in between. So now remember my first topic I like to cover in this course is a file system, file system and information system. So I'm actually going to start talk about this, this part, about this kernel. I'm actually starting with FFS from the disk block, FFS, and I will talk all the way up to the Vino in such that at least you have understanding about the whole file system, how they got implemented. Uh, from there, to just know the implementation is not necessarily so important, but the design principle for those people who designed the system like this way, even today, we're still using 
this uh, same architecture to understand that design principle is my instructional objectives, okay? Uh, by the way, um, this is a typical, I know most of you probably don't know the difference right now, but I hope after you go through the first two or three lecture, you won't be able to know what is what we call I know, what is what we call V know, and what's the difference between I know and V know. So just be careful that we're going to learn a lot about what is I know, what's a V know. In fact, a single processor operating system, the file system, the most important concept is I know. But when you want to go extend it, that concept to variety of different kind of uh, different type of file system you want to integrate. For example, you want to integrate a Unix file system with uh, FAT32, or you want to integrate it with NTFS, those kind of other file system developed by Microsoft, and Vino become really important to integrate all this, okay? All right, so I'm actually going to start talk about the lowest. So from the hard disk to the file. Let me actually see how much time I have. One second. Okay, I have about 20 minutes. Let me actually talk about this few slides then I'm going to turn the last maybe five minutes to the homework assignment number one. Okay, by the way, any question? Just want to double check, make sure before I, I don't want to go too much before I, okay, I didn't see any question. So I'm going back. <clears throat> uh, excuse me, professor. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, I had a question. I am uh, still unclear. Why is malloc not a system call? Okay, all right. So that's a good question. That's why I, I kind of very quickly go through that. So, so let me provide a very short answer. And if, if you still want to know more about this, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, and then we will, we will actually uh, talk about that. Uh, in, let me actually see if I have a memory map. Just go one second. Let me pull out my... Let me pull out, see if I can find a slide very quickly. One second. <clears throat> I haven't taught this for a while, so I'm going to look for my memory map. Not file system. Ha, huh. okay. I'm going to use this picture. Can, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. This is called the memory map. So every, every time you create a program, the operating system is going to assign, if it's a 32-bit computer, let's, let's use the example of the 32-bit computer. It's actually assigned you two to the 32 memory space, address space to this, uh, to this particular um, um, program, a process, usually we call it. So in this memory map, you can actually see there are two regions of memory. One region is a user stack, one is heap. So essentially when you make a function call, you actually access the memory on the user stack. So for example, main function called foo, foo called bar, and you have a stack element is being actually grow in the user stack area, okay? So when you make a function call, it's not a system call, why? Because all the memory you're accessing is the memory that's already given to you. Virtually, at least virtually, you actually have all the memory space. Uh, 
So similar to malloc and free, malloc and free, the memory that they actually access is under the heap area. So this memory address is actually being provided by the, uh, by the when you create a process, you already have that. And therefore, when you do malloc or you, when you do free, it's actually a piece of code, not in the kernel, but outside the kernel, which is in the form of a library, is try to manage your, your memory, the memory for this program. So, so in other words, what I'm saying is that when you do malloc and free, you're not going to access the memory of another program. You're not going to access the memory of a kernel. But all you're doing is with, within your own memory region that's virtually being assigned to you. And therefore, when you do malloc and free, usually 99% of the time, it's not going to involve kernel. The only chance that you will involve kernel is that when you allocate so much and such that it triggers certain uh, unexpected condition about memory management and the operating system kernel will uh, intervene in that process. But by default, if your program is correct, is not allocating strange memory, then it will not be a, a, a system call issue. It means that it's not going to be trapped into the kernel. I mean, for example, let, let me actually just tell you another way any call could invoke uh, operating system kernel. I mean, you probably saw a, a, uh, a condition called segmentation fault. So when you have a segmentation fall, which means that you're actually triggering a condition the operating system prohibit. And of course, operating system will intervene under that process. But unless that happened, that is, is on your map. This is called memory map. And uh, um, um, I, I just wonder whether that helped to, for you to understand why malloc is not a system call. Uh, yes, it did. So okay. a, a, a quick follow-up question would be, what is uh, like, what if I allocate my memory using MMAP? MMAP is a system call. Okay. MMAP is a system call. And MMAP is actually try to map. I mean, there are two, two different way of using MMAP. One way is you can map your, your, um, your file into your memory. So basically when you do mmap, you actually uh, map a particular file and that file is actually going to be part of your uh, memory address space. So you actually access that using like accessing a file to, to like you access the memory. So in, in, in that sense, when you actually call mmap to set up that relationship, it's actually an operating system call. But the other way of using MMAP is a, is a share memory, that you actually create a piece of memory that's, that's actually be able to map to two different process. So they both can actually access the, the, the same region to do share memory. When you actually try to access that, that is a system call. Okay. Does, does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <clears throat> Okay, where is my slide? It must be here. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back to a file system. And the question I want to ask you is that, um, how do I actually store a file on a hard disk? Okay, that, that's very fundamental, right? Assuming, that here's your hard disk. So essentially your hard disk gets separate into blocks. Each block could be 1K by or 4K by, uh, even larger blocks. So, so essentially your physical hard disk have a set of blocks. And, and now you actually have a file, which is for example, in this example is five blocks. It's a five blocks. And how do I actually represent uh, this? How do I store this five block into the, the hard disk? And more importantly, 
how do I be able to retrieve those five block of file sequentially? So, so sequentially doesn't mean I want to access sequentially, it means that I know the order. So, so by the way, I, I forgot to ask you a very important question at the beginning. What is the definition of a file? A file is essentially is a sequence of bytes. It's not the bytes without order. It's a it's a sequence of bytes with order from the beginning to the to the end. That's the definition of a file. Very important. It's a sequence. So therefore, when I have five blocks of file, which is five, four, seven, two, ten, twelve, means that. This is a block number two, this is block number four, this is block number seven, this is block number 10, this is block number 12. So essentially I store my file. The first block of this file is actually here, block number four. And then the second part is block number seven. And then the third block, I kind of go back to block number two and then block number 10 and then block number 12. So I actually have this five blocks on my hard disk. So now my question is, how do I actually be able to retrieve this file or actually be able to link those two five blocks together? So how will you do that? How do you actually represent? Okay, by the way, there is another important information for you to be aware of is that when you shut down your machine, so, so what's a file? The second property about the file is that the file must be persistent. Means that you shut down your machine and you turn on the power again, you will still be able to access the file. That's, that's basically, we use it all the time, but, but now we're gonna see how we're gonna do that. Because, okay, number one, the file is a sequence of byte. Number two, it has to be persistent. So it means that all the information you have about the file for you to retrieve the file must need to be stored in the hard disk. So now I'm going to ask you, well, how do you actually be able to store that information also on the hard disk, your file system? Any idea how you can actually do that? How do you actually put this five blocks of information together? How will you do that? In a note table. You said a note table. Okay, you have a table. And what kind of table? Ah, okay. I actually saw one answer. Uh, uh, Fuming, I will talk about I know and V know later. Not, don't worry. But I actually saw store the address of the next page into the last block of the current page, right? Okay, so let, uh, let's, that, that's a good, that's called linked list. Let's actually take a look, I, because I actually have this example. So this is kind of like what we're doing. It's like a linked list. Four, seven, two, 10, 12, right? And so there's a block number uh, zero, block number one, two, three, four, five blocks, right? So now we can actually store the pointer to the next. So over here, uh, it will store a pointer to seven. Over here, the store to two. Over here, so 10 over to 12, right? So that, that's basically a one way to do it using the data structure we're familiar with. It's called linked list, right? Um, okay, so what's the disadvantage of this? I already actually point out there are two disadvantages of this design. The first disadvantage is that if I do linked list, the, um, the, the, I mean, the, the disk access has to be sequential. Remember all five blocks are in the, in the hard disk. And, and to, to do that is actually really bad. Okay, for, for sequential access. I mean, um, right now you don't need to worry about this anymore. Uh, because you're using Netflix and uh, um, um, YouTube to watch a video, you can do fast forward, right? So um, I actually, I'm much older than all of you probably. Um, so when I actually watch movie, I was watching movie on DVD. 
typically is a DVD is probably four gigabyte or um, eight gigabyte. You can imagine there was a, so many blocks that's actually on a DVD when I want to watch the whole movie. And, and the thing is that I'm the guy who is not very patient. So, so I don't know how you watch movie. This is typically the way I watch a movie. I typically watch the movie for the first two minutes. And then I fast forward to look at the last three minutes before the credit to see the result. And then I decide whether I want to watch that movie or not. Okay, that, that's the way I actually do. Look at the first part and immediately fast forward to the last part and then see what's the last part so I can decide. And if, if we actually implement the, the file system uh, on a DVD using this particular scheme, it's horrible because, which means that I need to go through every single disk block of that four gigabyte movie before I can actually see the last two minutes of the movie, okay? So, so number one, random access is a bad concept for this type of uh, linkless architecture. But the second part is also even more interesting is, is related to power of two. It's related to power of two. Um, so if you have uh, been working on computer, you know, that power two is really, really nice property for a lot of operation. For example, if the power two, if it's uh, multiplication, it's just shift one bit. If it's a division, it's also shift one bit. If it's a power two. If it's not power two, if you want to do division or multiplication, it's quite expensive. That's why we like to do everything with a power of two. So with this, what should be the size of each block? If the size of each block is a power of two, then basically the real yellow region of that data content that you want to sort the file cannot be power of two. So essentially either your disk block has to be not power of two or your data content has to be not power of two. And this is totally, um, kind of incompatible when we want to make sure everything is a power two. So essentially this, this particular design is, is actually nice, but it's actually have uh, some kind of limitation, uh, at least two major disadvantage for us to decide. This is not something we want to implement in the, in the file system. And therefore, I'm actually going to start talking about on Thursday, a concept called I know. I know is called index node. It's essentially a data structure to hook all the disk block together for a file system and will support random access, number one. And it actually makes sure that everything is power two. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at this part. And this is just show you the picture. This is what we call an I know. And then I will, I will explain why it is uh, on Thursday. All right, I still have about five minutes. I want to talk about homework assignment number one, okay? Very quickly. So I don't know any of you have already, um, already started looking at homework assignment number one. So homework assignment number one, I basically want you to, um, that's really two concepts I want you to learn. One concept is called JSON RPC. Uh, which is a remote procedure call package that's actually using JavaScript object notation for its specification and for everything, essentially. That's number one. And number two is a concept, uh, I call a shadow object, but it's really calling a, uh, it's a, like a proxy about how you can access to the object. Um, and I just want to, this homework is just want you to be familiar with the concept and you actually know how to do some basic programming. So we can actually extend this to implement a distributed file system in the subsequent homework. Okay, so I actually provide uh, the, the description about how you can go through this homework step-by-step. Step. The first part is just for you to install. By the way, there's something I, I need to let you know. Uh, you can use either uh, Mac OS to do that, or you can use Ubuntu to do that, 
or if you only have a window uh, machine, which you have a window 10, you can actually install something called WSL, window subsystem, sorry, WSL, window, window subsystem for Linux. So WSL is a Ubuntu, you can actually do it at the Ubuntu environment uh, uh, integrated with Visual Studio Code. And you can essentially have a uh, Ubuntu environment virtualized on your window environment, which is actually my favorite uh, platform uh, on window 10 or window 11, okay? So essentially you have either Ubuntu or Mac OS. Either case, this will work to help you to do the installation of JSON RPC package. All right, so the first part is just make sure you have an environment install and you will learn a lot about uh, um, the installation is not, not too much. If you have done this before, it will be take you maybe five minutes. And the second part is essentially you're given a reference implementation, already have something, and you're going to extend that something to be something more complete. Okay, so I'm going to show you a very simple demo. Let me actually go here. <clears throat> So if you open your uh, reference implementation, which is, by the way, the reference implementation is already in the, let me see, homework assignment number one. Homework one, you can see that there's a reference implementation. It's already in the, in the canvas, you can download. And you use the tar command to basically untar it and to have this directory called ECF 251 homework one, uh, winter 2022. 20, uh, okay, and this is what you got. Of course, you type a make, as everything can be compiled. Okay, so you, you actually generate three programs. One is called HW1 client, one is called HW1 server, one is called HW1 another. All right, so let me actually tell you what's the difference. So JSON RPC has a file called specification about how you're going to specify the function that your program are going to exchange. Uh, so, so essentially you're making a call that's actually not to call to the local, but you actually call a system or service on a different machine. So that's called remote procedure call. So let's actually, sorry, just give me one minute so I can finish this. So if you look at, this is the, um, the ECF 251 HW1 JSON, it's actually only specify one function. And this one function is called get distance. It only specify the function name is called get distance, has take so many parameter, and it will return. So it basically specify the format of the call between the client and the server. All right, so that's the first one. It's already implemented. So you can actually, for example, if you go to more shadow fly.cpp, you can actually see that I'm actually calling this function get distance. That's the function I'm talking about. And then this program actually show how you can get the fly distance from a remote object. That's the real fly. So you have a shadow fly, which is locally make the call, but it connect to the real fly object on the server side. Okay, so that's actually the, uh, the first part. So that is the, the make file is actually take this one, generate two file. One is called HW1 client.h, one is called hw1server.h. Those two files are generated. If you take a look at this very quickly, this code, it says is generated by JSON RPC stuff. Do not change it manually. If you look at this, it's generated code called get distance. And it encode all this uh, data that you try to pass to remote, they encode it into a JSON format. This part is all JSON programming that they can actually uh, encode it nicely into a JSON and then send it to the other. It says call message, get distance, it will call the remote one. 
Okay, so the last part I want to show you is that, however, when you want to implement, I already provide one function, which is get distance, but this is the one that you really want to complete. This one has a four function. It has get distance. It has the second function called conflict of interest. The third one is actually a overloading operator, um, but in C++ it's supposed to be operator equal equal, but the, in, in JSON, I have to call the operator EQ EQ, okay? And the fourth one is called get VSID, get virtual student ID, by the way, that's how it comes up. So essentially, instead of the reference implementation get you one function, you're actually going to expand that to support all three functions. So by doing this uh, homework assignment, it's actually get you be familiar with both the JSON RPC uh, programming and also get you the concept about how do you actually set up a proxy very easily that you can actually do ready to do distributed programming um, doing that. And then I provide you a make file which is actually, you can see that it has all the, all the library that's already included. For example, JSON CPP, it has a micro HTTPD, has, a, has a also JSON RPC CPP library. Everything should be there. Okay, so I'm actually going to stop here. I will probably show you demo next time. So I will slowly let you understand what's going on. Okay, any question? <clears throat> Okay, so thank you very much for all of you uh, come in. I know um, um, uh, some of you are still on the wait list. So I, I need to figure out how to handle that. I already make a request to the department saying that whether we can enroll, enrollment can be a little bit bigger so we can accommodate more students. Okay, so uh, that's it for today and uh, you have a good day and I will see you on Thursday, the same time.